This week on Prophecy News Update, Independence Day. For most Americans, the word independence means more than a break in this country's ties with Great Britain. It is a celebration of the freedoms that made the formation of the United States unique in world history. But those freedoms do not come with a guarantee. Today, we stand at a crossroads. We can proceed to more freedom, more prosperity, and more security for everyone, or we can watch freedom die. Please consider subscribing to the Prophecy News Update YouTube channel or follow Prophecy News Update on Facebook. I had planned to make this program about the divine origins of America's greatness. I wanted to tell about an amazing America, America the Great and America the Beautiful. But I can't talk about America today without talking about the existential threat now looming over the very soul of our great nation. Let's start with the discomfort some feel when they hear someone speak of America's greatness. When some Americans hear that kind of talk, they automatically begin to recite the nation's failings as if programmed and triggered to do so. It is imperative that we see America in the context of history and America's past leaders in the context of the times in which those men and women lived and spoke. America's flaws stand out more than those of other nations because they stand in stark contrast to American ideals. Thomas Jefferson served as the primary author of the Declaration of Independence. He wrote the words, We hold these truths to be self-evident, that all men are created equal, that they are endowed by their Creator with certain unalienable rights, that among these are life, liberty, and the pursuit of happiness. Beautiful words. But Thomas Jefferson owned slaves. He called slavery a moral and political depravity. Talking specifically of slavery, he wrote, I tremble for my country when I reflect that God is just, that his justice cannot sleep forever. Yet, he owned slaves. When mobs recently started tearing down statues, they started with prominent members of the Confederacy. But they didn't stop there. They couldn't. When we examine the lives of honored dead, the fallen nature of human beings inevitably shows itself. Soon the mobs were defacing the statues of everyone, including abolitionists. After all, they weren't perfect either. All have sinned, the Bible says. George Washington, the father of our country, owned slaves. Abraham Lincoln, trying not to sound like an extremist in mid-19th century America, said some, well, some bad things. So he's out. Theodore Roosevelt was the first president to invite a black man to dine with him at the White House, but he never invited him back. Also, T.R. did a lot of stuff that people in those days really admired, but Today, not so much. So he's out. You might have noticed that we've now named all the presidents enshrined on Mount Rushmore, and some of them with prominent monuments on the National Mall. With every monument and work of art torn down, the new American revolutionaries look more like ISIS or the Taliban. Destruction of art is a close cousin to burning books. But these things happen when mobs rule. Our constitutional republic is made to accommodate lawful change. If a statue honors a scoundrel, point it out. Tell the press. Hold a protest. Then let your lawfully elected representatives know about it and let them decide to remove that monument. If mobs do it, then you have mob rule. And I promise you, you don't want mob rule. Lately, journalists seem to have discovered that in its original form, the Constitution had flaws. Several recent articles have pointed this out. They seem to 
have forgotten that the Constitution was designed so that flaws could be fixed by way of amendments. The other really important thing to remember about the Constitution is that it provides checks and balances throughout government, believing the Christian concept of humans carrying within themselves a fallen nature, the Constitution put checks and balances throughout our system. The Founding Fathers disagreed with the idea we hear so often today that everyone is basically good. They understood that humans are not what God made us to be, but that we are a fallen version of ourselves. And so people have to keep an eye on people, especially keep an eye on people in power. And we have to protect one another from the worst among us. And that is why we must have police. That's why in 1992, Bill Clinton ran for president on a platform calling not for the dismantling of police departments, but for the strengthening of police departments. He called for 100,000 more police officers on the streets of America. Studies show that this is one of the best ways to deter crime. While we must recognize the need for police, we must also recognize that, like the rest of us, each police officer carries a fallen nature. So police must be policed. In performing their extremely difficult duties, they must be held to the highest standards. Police officers are human, vulnerable to the same foibles as the rest of us, but because they are human, they should also be afforded human dignity, respect, and in legal matters, the due process we would all want for ourselves. Just like you or me, a police officer should never be fired arrested, or indicted as a way to appease the irrational rage of a mob. In full riot gear, a police officer may look a little like Robocop, but he or she is anything but. When you see a police officer stand unblinking while being cursed at, shoved, and spit on, remember that the person behind the badge is a human being, not a machine. They hurt. They get angry, frustrated, and discouraged. In the face of vile threats, they too can become afraid. Their adrenaline flows just like yours would flow in the face of peril. It's frustrating that police aren't perfect. It's frustrating that we even need police, but we do. It's frustrating that we have passionate disagreements over crucial issues. It's frustrating that wherever humans go, hate and prejudice follow. It's frustrating that none of us are perfect, not even our heroes. Both history and current events repeatedly prove the Bible's view of humanity, that we are wondrously made in the very image of God, capable of amazing, astounding things, but also fallen, not what God made us to be. That's why when the mob started tearing down statues, they didn't stop with members of the Confederacy. A statue of a human being is a statue of a being beset with flaws. I can illustrate this with a story that, frankly, I would rather not tell, but it proves what I'm talking about. Not far from the Lincoln Memorial in Washington stands a memorial to Dr. Martin Luther King, Jr., it's an important landmark in the United States, honoring a key leader from a pivotal time in American history. It should never be removed. But when you look closely at honored individuals, you will always find flaws. The night before his assassination in Memphis, Dr. King gave one of the greatest speeches in history. In that famous speech, he referred to Ralph Abernathy as his closest friend and associate, History bears out that statement. Please understand that to his dying breath, Dr. Abernathy considered Martin Luther King his best friend. Ralph loved and revered Martin. But in Ralph's autobiography, he gave a lot of details about things that happened between the speech and the awful moment of Dr. King's assassination. I won't go into the illustrations he gave of Dr. King's well-known problem with women, but what happened the next morning is not well known. Dr. Abernathy tells about a woman coming to his and Dr. King's motel room. 
He said this woman was livid that Dr. King had apparently not shown up for an appointment with her the night before. Abernathy wrote that as the argument got heated, King knocked her across the bed. He added that they, for a moment, were in a full-blown fight with King clearly winning. Considering the source, this is a highly credible allegation. It would be enough to get an NFL player suspended. But it is just an allegation. Martin Luther King is not here to defend himself. I wouldn't bring it up except to say that the greatest among us, like King David of old, can have extreme flaws. It disappoints us, but it does not negate the great things they said or did. The Martin Luther King Memorial should not be removed, and our capital city should not have Washington's name removed from it. The Washington Monument and the memorials to Lincoln and Jefferson should not be taken down. Those things are not there to honor or perpetuate the flaws of these men, but to honor the great things they did and the great things they said. We live in an era bereft of grace and forgiveness. One flaw triggers today's guillotines. And as the French learned, when guillotine blades begin to fall, they fall all over the place. They gain a momentum of their own. In America right now, people are urging the mobs on. They want this to be the hottest summer in American history. The ones urging on the mobs want power. What they don't realize is that when you create an atmosphere this volatile, the mob can turn on you. Pray for this country and pray urgently. We have mobs on the streets, mobs in cyberspace, mobs in media, mobs in education, and mobs in the halls of government. Violent mobs of all races and political persuasions. And they have placed this country and its freedoms in grave and imminent danger. If you long for real peace and real grace... If you long for someone who will never, ever let you down, turn to Jesus. He alone can clear the ledger of your flaws and faults and give you a clean, fresh start. I have some writing obligations I have to take care of, so it looks like our next program will be delayed until the end of July. God willing, I'll see you then.